Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 5. Um, the Apostle Paul, of course, talked about walking in love, walking in light, walking in wisdom. And now he gets down to some very practical application with various relationships that we have in our lives. And so let's look at the first one that he mentions, that is the husband-wife relationship, and he likens it, of course, to Christ in the church. We'll dig through some of those things, but let's read Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. Who will get that for us? Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. Ron. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his wife, excuse me, shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, so question number five I had asked to what is the husband-wife relationship compared and what significance does this give it? Of course, the relationship is? Christ in the church. Christ in the church. So what does that tell us? What significance does that place on it? The significance is we see how Christ valued the church and mm -hmm. that he gave his own life for the church. And... It is a holy relationship, it is sanctified, it is set apart, sacred for a specific purpose. Yes, yes, it's sacred. We need to view it as sacred. Our society does not view marriage as sacred. They view it essentially little more than a legal contract for a period of time. And as long as it's mutually beneficial, as long as they, they feel like they're getting their end of the bargain, they're, they're fine to stay in it, but when they don't like it, when things go wrong, they very often will discard it and find someone else. And, um, so it's not treated uh, either in society or by the law as something that is sacred, that is to be honored, that is to be revered. Um, but that's exactly what the Lord lays out for us here, of course, in other places as well. So question number six, I ask, why must a wife submit to her husband? And how do many people view this? So why must she do it? It's a command from God, number one. It's a comparison of the church to Christ. We understand how that is supposed to be. Mm hmm yeah if there's no other reason on earth it's to obey god because god said that's what wives must do um what else does it point out when when he describes it here you know the husband is head of the wife christ head of the church and he is the savior of the body so is her salvation dependent on whether or not she submits to her husband And is, did God arbitrarily set up the marriage relationship? Did he just sort of draw straws like, oh, she got the short end of the stick, so she has to submit? Clint? You can go back to Genesis 2 and see where that was. A, it was an institution immediately. 
immediately from the beginning set up. So absolutely not that it was arbitrary. It was, it was a, a cornerstone of society when man was created. Let me ask you this. Is there a flaw in the way God set up the relationship because one had to be submissive to the other? So what I'm driving at is, did God set up the marriage relationship exactly how it should be and exactly how it would benefit both the husband and the wife? Is there any mistake in here, any weakness in the way God set it up? Okay, some head shaking, no, you know, no. He didn't do anything halfway. I mean, every, what he did, he always had a purpose. He had a purpose, and it is perfect. Everything God does is perfect, and the way he set it up is perfect. Clint. The only flaw is the way man implements it. Okay. It's easy to get out of, whereas God says you can't break it. Unless I break it. Mm -hmm. Man says, well, we can have a no-fault divorce. But that bond is still there with God. How, how about on the idea of the wife submitting to the husband? That's an old-fashioned sexist thing. That's how people view it, right, Nancy or Ron? <coughs> yes. Uh, Stephen, in Titus 2, in verse 5, this passage is very impressive upon us. It says, you know, speaking of the husband and the wife and the children, the relationship, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. That's the right. significance of this. Do we look at that violation as blasphemy? Right, exactly. And the portion you just read there, obedient to their own husbands, sends people into orbit today. Um, I... I've done weddings where, well, I did actually ended up not doing this wedding, but there was one, uh, a couple close to us, uh, not members of the church, sat down, um, went over, okay, in the vows, you, the wife is going to say, I will be obedient to my husband. She said, no, that's not the way I was raised. And the night before the wedding, um, got somebody else to do it. I think that might have been prearranged because... I, I forget the exact details, but essentially, like, no. Even though you could open up the Bible, and this is exactly what it says, that is, if I'm doing the, the ceremony, that's going to be in there. Um, so anyway, yeah, people really chafe at this because we have this whole um, I perverted concept of equality in our society, and we see where that is leading. It, it started with husband, wife, and, you know, women's rights and all of this. And I'm all for women. I'm all, for, and we'll get down to that in a minute with the husband. But they have a perverted view of what that means and how that is applied in the husband-wife relationship in particular. And we see how far they've gone with it now to where, you know, they, they're they claiming there are really no, there's any gender you want to be, you can pick from, I forget if it's like three dozen different gender identities now that they're saying exist, which is some, you know, somebody's really insane when they think about that, when, if they're proposing that. But that, that's what we're saying. People take what God has established, they don't like it, and they will twist it into something it was never meant to be, misunderstanding what God actually teaches relative to these things. So, wives are submit to what husband? Verse 22. Their own husband. Their own husband. husband. Verse 22. Their own husband. Right. Submit to their own husbands as to the Lord. And notice that the command is directed to the wife. The command is not directed to the husband. Husbands, make your wives submit to you. This, this command is directed to the wife. It's, it's her responsibility to fulfill this command, not his responsibility to make her do it. And so we need to keep that in mind. Um, any other thoughts there? We could probably spend 
a couple of weeks in this section. We'll go ahead, Ron. Just real quickly to that point, there was uh, a husband who recognized his wife started showing greater submission to another man, and that began to indicate to him, which led ultimately to a divorce because of her infidelity. Mm -hmm. But she did start becoming submissive to another man. Right, right, to their own husband. So there, there is a limitation that God places around this. Says here, here's where that relationship exists between the husband and wife, not between the wife and the other men. Uh, and as you say, it can lead to all kinds of terrible consequences in that relationship, and of course, to the souls that are involved there. Um, to be subject to the husbands in how much? Verse twenty-four. Everything. What is accepted from everything? What's what's left out? Nothing. 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 And women, is, there are some women who really kind of struggle with that. But it's everything. And we're going to get to the men in a minute. But it's everything. There's nothing accepted there. So... That is that relationship, just as the church is subject to Christ in everything, just as we have to abide by His lead, His rule in our lives, and there's nothing accepted in that. That's what this is saying about the wife and her duty and her responsibility. Now, question seven, what does it mean for the husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church? Completely? The husband should sacrifice his needs to hers. So put her above him, kind of going back to Philippians 2, where it says, you know, put others' needs before. The husband should put the wife's needs before his own as a sacrifice, just as the example of Christ gave his life for the church. Ron? I was going to say the same. A sacrificial love is what relationship they're to have. Right, exactly, John. I think the ultimate goal of all this is is that the husband wants to get his family to heaven, so they're going to work work together in the arrangement that God has arranged to make that happen. But the husband will strive to do that to the point of death, as Christ did for us to the point of death, to make sure that we can get to heaven. But that's, I think, the ultimate goal is he's going to sacrifice everything to make sure that his wife and his family gets to heaven, even to the point of death. It's, it's because that's what Christ did for us. That's the example that the husbands have. Do some men have a problem sacrificing for their wives, putting their needs first? Yeah, just as there are women who struggle with the idea of being submissive to the husband, there are husbands who struggle with the idea of sacrificing for the wife and, and putting her first. Um, they're to love their wives and putting their needs first, as we have mentioned, as Christ loved the church, He suffered for the church. Um, it was a complete love. There was uh, no area that was lacking when Christ showed love for the church, and there should not be an area where we are lacking as men. Um, it's an unwavering love. It's one that's steady and steadfast. Uh, exercising patience and long-suffering. Um, it says to love his wife as what? Down in verse 28. As her own body. So what would that imply? What's the point that he's making there? 28, 29. making the point of nourishing, cherishing, in other words, doing the things that are necessary to sustain and to preserve your own body, and that's what should be done with the relationship. The things necessary to sustain it, to preserve it, to protect it. Right, right, exactly. And so we, we go back to be submissive to their husbands and everything, 
is a husband who loves his wife as Christ loved the church, is, is he going to micromanage everything in her life? Not for long. There is a natural outcome, right? Um, that he's, he is not going to be hearing iron-fisted, you are going to do everything exactly the way I want the color of the, the uh, paint and the carpet, and I want this and I want that. And it's, it's not going to be about him. He's going to be thinking more about her. What is it that you want? Now, there are things in any relationship, and especially the husband-wife relationship, where you have disagreements, but you have to work that out in one way or another. Ultimately, the husband has to make a decision about what's going to unfold in the family, whether it's finances or time spent or where they live or anything else like that. But he has to be considering, is this going to be something that will help to cherish and nourish my wife? Will this build her up? Will this be something that is going to do detriment, harm, cause her pain and suffering? Or is it something that is going to be a benefit and a blessing to her? Now, there are things that a man has to make decisions on that it is going to cause difficulty for his wife, for his children, but sometimes those difficulties, those trials are necessary and there's a bigger lesson. He's not doing it for selfish purposes. He's doing it for a bigger purpose, a bigger reason. There, there are decisions that husbands make for the sake of the kingdom that can cause difficulty, trial for the children, for the wife, but he's doing it for the kingdom. He's doing it for the sake of their soul. And that's something that everyone needs to appreciate. No, we, none of us want to go through a trial necessarily and face pain, but sometimes it is the wise thing to do. It's the right thing to do in order to serve and honor God and to grow our character. So the husband's thinking about his wife. What can I do that's going to help her and benefit her spiritually? What's going to benefit her emotionally? He's going to cherish her. What is the idea of cherishing his wife? Nourishing, building her up, cherishing would be what? Any husbands want to speak on this? Well, I think that the idea is there in Proverbs chapter 31 where it talks about him finding an excellent wife. And, you know, men are driven for, um, you know, we want to be known in our field of whatever it is that we're doing uh, as one of the best. We're driven that way. But yet, in Proverbs chapter 31 says, if you have an excellent wife, you need to value her above all the um, things of this world that you possibly can think of. And there were, um, he says, for a work is far above jewels. And you know, those are the things that we kind of strive for. But we have to understand that a good wife, one that does the things that are described here in um, Proverbs 31, is we have to put more into that relationship than what we would as trying to strive for those jewels and the riches of and, um, and understanding that um, someone who does, I mean, I, I read their Proverbs 31, I'm thinking, now that's a full day there. Mm -hmm. and I know I don't, I don't put in that kind of time and energy and stuff like that into um, what's going on in the home. So I need to make sure that she understands that she's appreciated and that she's needed. Mm -hmm. Right. So the husband conveying to her that value, that appreciation that he has, he cherishes her. It may be things that he does for her. It may be, uh, you know, he gets home from work or, or if he works at home when he finishes up, hey, I'll, I'll take the dishes or I'll do X, Y, Z. That may be a way to convey to her. Now, she may not want him to touch the dishes. You know, some wives are like, you just make it a disaster, stay away from it. But others are like, yeah, I'm happy for you to do that. I'm going to go and relax. And that's a way to convey that he appreciates her, that he values her. And many different ways that that could come out in their day-to-day -day relationship. 
And it says here that he is to cleave to his wife, leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. What is that telling us? Plant and then fight. There's no longer a dependency for the parents' advice or the guidance. It's now you are one with your wife and you make decisions based upon that two people. It no longer is the, the parents involved in day to day operations. Okay. And Mike? You know, I was going to say, you know, work, you know, there means joined or bond together, but it's something that doesn't let go. You know, when you cleave to something, you grasp on to something, you don't let it go. And that's what, that's the idea here. You know, you're not going to, you know, if you're hanging from a tree or something like that, you're not going to, you're going to cleave to it. You ain't going to let it go. And that's the idea that's being, uh, you're, you become as one with it. Mm -hmm. And um, that relationship that you have with your mother and your father is one that you can let go. But this relationship that, that you have with the one that um, you've made that commitment to, there is no way to go. I mean, you must continue on, even during the hard times and, and all the vows that we say, rich and poor, sickness, health. And, um, you know, a lot of times that you know, people don't really kind of take that and understand what that idea of clean means. Right. And the relationship between the husband and wife takes priority over all other relationships. You know, sometimes young people get married, but they're still tied to their parents, and they're closer to their parents than they are their spouse, and they run to their parents for every issue that comes up, or they go and complain to them about their spouse, or they're always thinking about their parents first instead of their spouse first, and that gets in between the relationship. And then as parents... When our children get married, we need to learn to back off. They, they have a relationship that is now their priority in life, not us as their parents. That's each other as husband and wife. And so we are to have that emphasis on the relationship and clinging, cleaving, being glued, cemented together. Um, now then, Question number eight, what is Paul really discussing in these verses and what should we draw from this in light of the overall study in Ephesians? As it's paralleled to the Christ church relationship. Any thoughts? I had a couple. Uh, one was authority and obedience are what are being taught. And also priority, I mean purity and fidelity. Yes, exactly right. We are to be wholly committed to Him, not to resist, not to rebel against the Lord, not to behave in a way that brings shame and reproach on Him, the purity that we would have in that relationship, respecting Him as our head. All right, let's move on now. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4, please. Who will read that for us? Ephesians 6. Go ahead, Chris. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. <clears throat> Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment of promise, that it may be well with you, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on, long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Okay. So children are to respect their parents. Uh, to whom is this directed? When you read verse 1, who do you think of? What age range of children? Children in the home. Children in the home? Anybody want to be more specific? Okay, all right. You, you could read this to a three-year-old. Okay, does it apply? Sure, it applies to a three-year-old. But they're not really going to grasp all of it, right? 
It's more directed toward those who have that maturity level. They can understand, I have a responsibility to my parents based on my relationship to the Lord. If I'm going to be pleasing to Him, then this is how I need to behave toward my parents. And so, yes, I would agree, those who are older, teenage years, maybe even early 20s and things like that. But really, this, as he goes on down here, it's really, when he talks about honor father and mother, what does that mean? How long does that relationship between parents and children last? As long as the parents last. Yeah, or the children. Yeah, either way. Yeah. But, yeah, as, as long as the parents are around. Really what he's talking about there, and you go back to the Old Testament and you see how Jesus interacted with the Jews, really what that's talking about is you, your parents get to a point that they need your help and you need to look out for them. You need to honor them. You need to honor them. But the first part in verse 1, the idea of children under their parents' authority, they need to respect them and submit to that authority to obey your parents in the Lord. What does that tell us? Well, if someone's old enough to know that what they're doing is honoring the Lord, they're, they know as they're doing going throughout life, they're doing something because the Lord says to do it this way, and I'm, I'm doing it this way because I know my folks want me to do this, but ultimately I know that God wants me to do this. So they're, they're doing it because the Lord wants them to do that. Yeah, the Lord wants them to do that, and within the bounds of God's Word. So if the parents tells them to lie... They're not obligated to lie. Tells them to go, you know, go get my beer at the store. Go pick that up and bring it to me. They're, they're not obligated to do that. It's within the Lord, within the bounds of truth and righteousness. That's where this is founded here. Now, in the context, he's assuming the parents are good, righteous, upright parents. So, you think about that that they to obey their parents in the Lord, they never violate the will of God by submitting to their parents, and that applies to the wife as well. She's not bound to be submissive to her husband when if he tells her to do something that's sinful. She is to resist that because our relationship to God is always the primary relationship and everything else is secondary and must be sacrificed for that relationship. So, children, obey your parents in the Lord because parents are generally wiser. They love their children. They want to see what's best for their children. They can see things that the children cannot. And sometimes it's merely by instinct that the parents are like, I don't like the way that sounds. Can't put my finger on it but there's something there that's not good, and that's just through years of experience and instinct, and the children need to appreciate that, that they can help you to avoid a lot of problems in your life by giving you some guidance and feedback and by stopping you from doing some things that you think are perfectly okay and acceptable. Clint. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but it's the same parallel guideline and stipulation on verse 7. Rendering service for the goodwill as to the Lord and not to man. It's yes. just that same idea of the guideline is within God. You should do this. Yes. You either honor your parents, obey them, or work for your employer. But there are clear lines of right and wrong. You stay within the right, and you're doing it as to the Lord. You're doing it for the Lord. Yes, exactly right. So he says, this is a, the first, which is the first commandment in the New King James Version. The idea is really the foremost commandment. It's, it's the, remember in the Ten Commandments, you had the first four that dealt with God's relationship to man, and the last six that dealt with man's relationship to man. And the first one on that list of man's relationship to man was honor your father and mother. And so it's a foremost or a leading commandment that God expects us to respect and follow 
and apply in our lives. Uh, we need to honor them, care for them, treat them with respect and dignity uh, throughout their lives because you may live a long life. That is, it'll be a blessing in your life, a full, longer life. Um, you go back to the Old Testament, you see some examples with like Amnon or Absalom, how they didn't honor their father, David, and they ended up having their lives cut short. So some very good examples there in the Old Testament. Then what does it say fathers are to do in verse 4? Not provoke them to wrath. How can a father provoke his children to wrath? We don't want to come. Sorry, Ron. No, go ahead, John. No, I, I, was, I didn't see it there, so. Well, I was thinking one way is to create frustration with a child, and that can come through inconsistency in your expectations, your treatment to that child, and just sending, as we'd say, the wrong signals all the time. And the child becomes frustrated because they don't know how to please their father or their mother if you're very inconsistent with your treatment to the child. Right. John? I think it ultimately that treatment that Ron's talking about can cause that child to sin, to be angry, to be wrathful, which is sinful towards God. So we don't mm -hmm. want to cause that. That's something that is is uh, shameful for a father to do, to do to their children to drive them to the point where we cause them to sin. Right. Right. Just look at Jacob's family. Horrible, horrible family for many years in the, the jealousy, the rivalry among those brothers. That's exactly right. Uh, so you, you've got the inconsistency. You've got the favoritism that's being shown. Mike? Uh, I was going to back up just for a second where it mm -hmm. says, Mm -hmm. That is that you can live a long life. And, you know, whenever you have parents who say, stay away from this crowd, many times people who run with that crowd will end up dead a lot sooner than, you know, if they were just to listen to their parents. Stay away from this, stay away from that, you know, and you, you know, it's like you're going down the highway of life and parents have this warning light that goes off that mm -hmm. many times children and young teens and older teens and even young adults don't have that that says danger ahead. So it's always good to listen to the voice of experience. And also, you know, whenever it talks about the fathers don't provoke your children to anger, it doesn't mean that they don't get mad because the second part of that says, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So when you're having to discipline someone, that's never fun and it can create anger and hostility and but you have to understand that what the children are, are told to do is to obey the parents in the Lord and if that instruction that's part of the instruction that's kind of going on and if that instruction is not followed then yes there has to be discipline and um, you know just as has been pointed out the inconsistency that um, men have in their homes with their wives and with their um, children it can lead to frustration and anger and people being angry all the time. And so mm -hmm. we have to be aware of that and, you know, as, um, as husbands and as fathers understand that, you know, like we talked about with the relationship with the wife, we're not dictators, we're leaders. We have to lead by example. Right. Yeah, their, their behavior with their children uh, setting that example. Um, and one of the things I have, you can provoke them to wrath by a lack of discipline. It, it can really cause them to be angry um, because children are looking for boundaries. They are looking for what do I do here? Is this right or wrong? And if I do something wrong, are you really, is, are you really serious about this? Are you not serious about this? So yeah, the discipline. And then in later years, some children have looked back and they have realized my parents were way too easy on me. They, they let things go they should not have let go. And that can be an issue that, that arises later. So all these things can um, provoke them to wrath and cause problems 
in the family and give them a misunderstanding of what it is to be a husband, a wife, a father, a mother when they enter into that relationship and it handicaps their family, their marriage. All right, any other thoughts to that point, Ron? Steve, I think today with parents and their children, it is particularly challenging because there are so many entries, if you will, into the minds of children that, you know, I would have never even envisioned that can pervert their thinking, corrupt their morals. It's just astounding. Right. Um, the, on, on that point, almost every single sitcom and a lot of the, I'll, I'm just going to use one company here, but it would be more than this, a lot of Disney stuff, teach that children and young people are smarter and wiser and the parents are stupid and all of that. And that soaks into their minds over time. And we have to work to counteract those kinds of things. If, if they're seeing that, being exposed to it, at the very least, we need to be like, that's wrong. And here's why it's wrong. Things like that. But we, like you say, there's so many entry points. Uh, school systems, the education system, not every one, not every class, not, not every teacher, but the overall education system in our society is wholly anti-family and anti-God. And we have to be very careful about that. I know, you know, um, teachers up in Kentucky, some in the church there, that they worked as a filter for those kinds of things, you know, that were coming down from on high. They, there were things they would do and things they wouldn't do. So they, they tried to protect the children that were under their care. But there are so many different ways that this affects families and it incites rebellion and a misunderstanding of how a family is to be in the sight of God. Husband, wife, children, all those relationships. Any other thoughts there? All right, Mike. Just one, one quick thing, and I was going to say that you know it's important that we look at that construction of the Lord because, as you're pointing out, all of this time and energy and money and everything else is being spent to fill minds with much more of a humanistic type of uh, teaching and way of life. We have to be the counter to that. Mm -hmm. So that means we've got to spend time in understanding what's coming to them so we know how to, you know, repel it and all that kind of stuff. And even some of the things that even the uh, our children, um, you know, kind of bring home from school and stuff like that. Now I'm having to re-educate myself, understanding what are they studying, what's being um, taught, so that I know, okay, well, that's not correct and this is why. So right. Or else you're caught off guard and just ran over. Yes. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. Very good. All right, let's read verses 5 through 9 now. Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9. Who will grab that for us? John. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering a service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he was both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Okay. So, servants and masters, masters, servants, of course, it applies, employees, employers, and those kinds of relationships that we have today. Um so he says to be obedient to those who are your masters with fear and trembling in sincerity. What's, what's the idea there, fear, trembling, sincerity? Fear of what? Of who? Rick? God. Fear of God. The Bible does not teach us to fear man. It teaches us to fear God. Um, now, if we do something wrong, it talks about fearing the authorities or fearing the king. 
the one who has the right to exercise punishment on evildoers. So, but here he's talking about you have a relationship with God and you need to be mindful of that first and foremost. And it should govern that relationship you have with your master or with your employer, your boss, your manager, who, whoever that may be. Um, says they're not with eye service. What is eye service? Mike. Well, uh, you encounter all the time as a manager, and that is you just kind of walk up and talk about all the service and busy. <coughs> the boss walks up. And, um, you know, that's just eye service. And some people are even horrible at that. They're more lip service than anything. That is, I'll get that done, and they never do get it done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's just the, I, the idea of let your JBA and your Navy name and let your. Um, your um, works match the words that you say also. Yes, definitely. And, you know, I, I think I've seen this more with, like, in a peer environment. So, like, in the Air Force, when either the station chief or the officer wasn't there, there's one way that some guys behaved. And as soon as they appear... Man, it's like they're the number one person there. It's like, where'd you come from? <laughs> I, I've been doing everything for the past seven hours. Where, where have you been? And they come alive all of a sudden. That's, that's the eye service, you know, and it, it really causes a problem among your peers. They do not like that person at all um, for those who are actually getting at it and getting the work done. Mike? To you know, sum it up with a with an uh, English idiom, and that is, when the cat's away, the mice will play. Right. And that's very prevalent in the workforce. Right. Your your employer or whoever it is that's, that's over you, they should be able to completely disappear, and they come back. And you have been working diligently. You have been, you have been a faithful servant. You have uh, been a good steward of everything that's been going on. And they find it as good or better than when they took off, when they left, and, and then when they come back in. So that, that's the responsibility we have. Um, faithfulness as an employee is going to face us in the day of judgment. Um, we're going to have to give an account for that. In verse 9 then, when it talks about the, the masters, what's he talking about there? Clint? Those who have general authority over the work, or you in particular, uh, or how you receive Okay, um, what's he saying is the, the master or the employer or the manager's responsibility? Well, he says um, in verse 9, the masters do the same to them. And that is, don't look like you're busy also, you know, and, um, and then turn your back on whenever, they, whenever, you're most, whenever you're most needed. You have a responsibility to take care of people. You need to make sure that that's done as well. Um, whatever your role is, and this is really what it's talking about, whatever your role is, play it well. I mean, you know, do it well. And don't just look like uh, one thing, but yet you're a completely different other thing. And then he goes on, you need to stop your threatening. You know, I mean, I've seen uh, managers do that before. If you don't do this, I'm going to fire you. And it's just my fear and intimidation that they manage. And it never works. And, you know, a lot of people leave situations because of that. Right. And there are places where there's a culture of managing through fear and intimidation and favoritism and things like that. And he's saying, you, you can't do that. It doesn't matter really what's going on in, in that company, that culture, that setting, what, whatever it might be. You, you need to give that up knowing that your own master is also in heaven. In other words, there's somebody who's giving an account to you. But remember, you're going to give an account to Him, and there is no partiality with Him. We're, we're not going to sweet-talk our way out of 
getting in trouble with God. We're, we're not going to, to be able to gain favoritism. We're going to be judged very fairly and righteously and strictly by His law. And so we need to respect that in these relationships. Now, I want to back up for just a minute because we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, back in Ephesians 5.21, what does it say? And then what does he follow up with? From 5.22 down to 6.9. Okay. Does a husband submit to the wife? Anybody? Yes. A husband submits to the wife when he serves her and puts her needs first. He's submitting his need to her needs. Do parents submit to their children? All the time, right? All the time. We are bending and giving and sacrificing for our children, and in that way we're submitting for their needs. I mean, you just take the very basic idea of a little baby coming into the world. They have no concept of time, right? Or sleep. If they're up at 2 a.m., they're just up at 2 a.m., and that's that. And what does the mother or the father or both of them have to do? Well, they've got to be up. They've got to be seeing to their needs, taking care of them, right? That's them submitting. You know, they could, I suppose, go lock that little baby into a room and put pillows over their head and just sleep and just say, you know, but what do you think about a parent like that? That's terrible. No. They're, in a way, they're submitting to their children. They're submitting to their needs, seeing that their needs, their their. Uh, uh, Th their needs, I'm looking for another word, but are being met. And employee and employer, the employer, the one who is the leader, is thinking about how can I help them? How can I improve their job? How can I help them be successful in their work? And that means they're sacrificing. They're going in at 5.30 in the morning or 5 in the morning so the employee doesn't have to come in on what's probably their only day off. They do things like that, thinking about how, how can I serve them. And so he started, he, he led into this list of relationships by saying submitting to one another in the fear of God. Well, we, we are thinking about the best thing for each other, as Clint had mentioned before, about not only looking out for your own interests, but for the interests of others and being a blessing to them. And when we do that, whatever role we're in, if, if both people in that relationship, whether it's husband and wife, parents and children, employee, employer, if we are all thinking about each other and how to best serve one another, that's when we're going to have healthy, enriching relationships that are a blessing in our life. John. You could also throw the, that Jew-Gentile relationship that he's addressed in here. He's addressing that problem, but he's he's adding this to it because this, this, that, that's part of the, the overreaching problem is that that uh, you know, problem between the races. Yes, between the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, something he's certainly addressed heavily in this letter. Any other thoughts, Ron? Mike touched on threatening, but I I also Stephen want us to, and myself as well, to recognize how damaging threatening is to relationships. You know, we see it within families when children and parents threaten one another, husbands and wives, when people are threatening in the church and what it does. You mm -hmm. know, and it, that threatening could appear as that if they don't get their way, they're threatening to leave the congregation. Mm -hmm. And in the workplace, I mean, that's the basis of where labor unions started and the conflict mm -hmm. and the stress. And we see it in our nation. The, how it polarizes people. And it is just so counterproductive to good. You can see why it is specifically mentioned to us here. Right, right. That's a good point. Because there, there are certain behaviors, certain things that we can do that poison that relationship, that poison that environment. And it's hard to extract that over time. It can be done over time, but it's hard to extract that. It makes things much more difficult. 
So exactly right. All right, very good. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to pick up Ephesians 6 verse 10 next week. Uh, we might just spend our entire time in the rest of Ephesians chapter 6 because I, um, I feel like we've been hurrying a little bit. And that's my fault. Um, and I want to see if we can just slow that down just a little bit. So Lord willing, Ephesians 6 verse 10, we'll pick up there next week.